Thank you. Good evening, everybody. If we can stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, we are going to start with our exemplary people. And our high school principal, Mr. Cobbs, is going to come up first to um, speak about and announce our National um, Merit Scholars. Thank you. Uh, Misha, uh, Big crowd tonight. Very exciting. So as you know, um, maybe they should hear and talk about them. Over here. Thank you, everybody. Get closer. Girls come in because they're going to take pictures. And, yeah, oh. I comb my hair for this and everything. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, every October, all the Massey juniors take the PSAT, which is also known as the National Merit, Schol uh, National Merit Scholarship Qualifying Test. That's why I had to write this down. Uh, the, Ma the National Merit Scholarship Corporation recognizes the top 50,000 um, scores as commended students and the top 16,000 performers, or the top 1%, as National Merit Scholarship semifinalists. Massick this year had 10 commended students and five national semifinalists. The five semifinalists then had an opportunity to continue on in the merit scholarship competition and advance to finalist standing by meeting a number of additional requirements, including the submission of SAT scores, uh, drafting a personal essay, and also submitting a letter of uh, recommendation from their guidance counselor. Uh, I don't remember us having one in the past few years, let alone three this year, so I'm very pleased to announce that from those five, Massick had three students, Nisha Hanaya, Catherine Lee, and Chloe Shalwa, selected as scholarship winners by the National Merit Scholarship Corporation. sat down because we're getting back up again. Um, we're going to have Lisa Peterson come up, who is our instructional leader at the high school, for, well, actually for the middle school and the high school, um, for world languages. And we are going to recognize our students who have earned the seal of biliteracy. And Lisa, you want to talk first about what that is, and then we'll have the kids come up. The seal of biliteracy is new to the state this year. It is a state recognition for students who have achieved proficiency in English and a second language. Students will actually earn the seal at graduation um, when they pass their English class, but assuming that that happens, um, <laughs> these students have shown the necessary level of proficiency in the language that I'll announce in a few minutes. To, to qualify in that second language, students have to pass four separate exams, one in speaking, one in listening, one in reading and one in writing, and these students are our first because it's new to the state this year. <coughs> our first student has demonstrated proficiency in Arabic, Mohammed Si. Yep. And when I call your name when you come up, if you just stay back here. In French, Katie DeGeorge. In Latin, Kevin Brown. Also for Latin, Sloan Berlin. <laughs> and 
and finally in Latin, Grace Richards Hannigan. And the final group of students are all in Spanish. Gina Dragonet. Nisha Hanaya. Mitchell Hornack, who I know cannot be here tonight. Kyle Emmel. Katie Jaleed. Emily Lane. Wen J. Lim. Caitlin Logan. Alex Massaro. Emily McMahon. Brianna Malloy. Melinda Primerac. Kaylee Raymond, Gabe Rodriguez, Kara Stabio, Chloe Shawa, Jeff Stofko, and Anika Varaga. How are we going to do that, Dr. Samuel? <laughs> 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 Can we just make it like a nice photo of me? Sure. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> 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 she didn't take over prom pictures this year, so that was good. Okay. All right. Oh, it's like Run, a row, bend down. Yeah. Are we supposed to hold them? Yeah. Like this? Everybody can go. We don't expect you to have to sit through our whole meeting. So, <laughs> but if you're more than welcome to stay if you'd like. Congratulations. So we asked for our board. Yep. All right, we'll let them file out and we'll move on to the report of the chairman. First, we have a new representative for our MASIC board, who is Molly Carrero, who is a junior. So, Molly, welcome. Hi. 
And next, we are going to recognize our two graduating seniors, both of who have served um, as Massac Board representatives for the past two years, who is Kevin Brown and Will Santi. So we have a little something for both of you. Yeah, I don't. I mean, you can come to the next one, but sometimes students don't come to the last one. <laughs> Will, thank you so much. Good luck next year. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. We can. We can definitely. I'm sure we can Skype you in. I'm, you know, this is technology at Villanova yeah, and too. Yeah. 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 And you know, we have really appreciated, you know, your thoughts on things. And when we bring up a new policy or a new procedure, you really have, you've, you've really contributed. So we thank you for that. that yes. And Molly, we're expecting the same from you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of pressure. The bar's really high, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we will move on to our consent agenda. Do I have a motion to approve? Thank you, Shannon. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Christine. Um, we will talk about our, we have a couple of appointments. Right, we have uh, the Stephanie art teacher, uh, Jennifer Silva, is, is in the packet. Also, Amanda Kirk, a Jackie Hollow counselor, and Joe Carino. Um, each of these, uh, all three of these um, teachers have taught in other districts and come with uh, some experience. And we went through an extensive process with all of them, um, and interviews, and then we had demonstration lessons. So we're pretty happy with the outcome, and we're glad that they decided to come with us. And I will just say before we take um, the vote that Jerry is abstaining because his daughter is actually one of our uh, new hires. He had nothing to do with it, but he is going to abstain from the actual vote of hiring her. Do I have any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of the consent agenda? Thank you, motion passes. We will move on to our reports of our committees and liaisons and our MASIC reps are up first. In line. <laughs> oh, I don't, uh, that's a dead language. <laughs> um, although the school year is coming to a close, it seems like a lot of stuff's going on uh, at MASIC, which is always fun. So. Uh, at 7 p.m. tomorrow in the auditorium uh, is the chorus concert. Uh, if you can attend, um, Wednesday night at 7, uh, we'll, uh, at the library, there's going to be a PTC meeting. Um, at that meeting, Dr. Greenwood will be there uh, to talk with the parents, uh, discuss, answer questions. Tuesday of next week is the senior trip to Six Flags in Springfield, Massachusetts. Uh, we're pretty stoked. <laughs> um, it's something, something really fun to do, and I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm really, what's the right word? Happy that the, the school offers this for further, for their seniors as kind of like a, a thank you for making this place, you know, I don't know, making the atmosphere as great as it is at Massac. Um, next Wednesday is Senior Awards. And also uh, on next Friday, we'll be having the Senior Banquet, which is kind of like prom part two, but more fun. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, we have an advisory this Wednesday, and it's a little bit messed up because of the storm last week where um, we had an AP test that was supposed to occur that day. It's the AP uh, Lang test, and she was involved in that. We have, like I think, 100 students who weren't able to take the test that day, so now they have to take it this Wednesday. Um, and it's the same day as an advisory, which is just great. Um, so our seniors will be having a class meeting where we discuss the trip, um, the capstone, and the banquet and all, all that. Um, and the juniors will be hearing about their senior portraits from LifeTouch. Um, Thursday is the dreaded capstone presentation where everyone gets out at 11 o'clock, and then the seniors present and the juniors get to watch us present. Kevin already got it out of the way. I did not. Yeah. Um, Thursday, we have the Sports Awards. Actually, Thursday of next week is the Sports Awards. And uh, the following Friday morning is the High Honors Breakfast at Massac in the Cafeteria.
<laughs> uh, like Will said, this Wednesday, about 100 juniors will be making up the AP language and composition test. So I think we'll be taking that in the morning block in the gym. And then that evening, starting at 5.30, the annual Walk for Hope will be happening at the Massac track. So registration starts at 5.30 and it'll begin at 6. And it's to raise awareness for substance abuse. And the Massac Interact Club will be there to decorate the field and help set up and make sure everything works out well. Um, on Friday, Massac's annual Specta Gala will be happening here in the library. Uh, so basically, it's like a living museum. Uh, kids and staff members will be making little like little setups of people or different aspects of the 1940s. And there will also be live, I mean, yeah, live music. It's a really great event that brings the entire community together. So it's a lot of fun. Uh, and then next Tuesday is the Underclassmen Awards at 7 o'clock in the auditorium. And that will be honoring freshmen, sophomores, and juniors for academic achievement throughout the year. Great, thank you. And thank you again for your participation. Anybody else have any other committee reports? David. Uh, Don, on Thursday, May 10th, the Health, Safety, Security, and School Climate uh, Committee met. Um, pretty much run-of-the-mill agenda and everything is going well. Uh, the buildings um, gave us updates on their drills that they're doing and um, a lot of good information and uh, good things that they're doing. Great. Anybody else? All right, we will move on to public participation. <clears throat> All right, Gary, now we will move on to the report of the superintendent. Okay, we're going to start with the fund statement, and Gabby's going to talk to us a little bit about that. Um, so April was uh, a little bit better than it's been the past few months, and we're, um, we've got four claims over stop loss and 48 claims over 25000 but we're still running behind last year, so that's actually a good thing. We're about $600,000 to the good of where we were at this point last year. So at the end of April, our fund balance was somewhere about 850000 So um, we're hopeful that... June 30th won't be as bad as last year's doing. June 30th when we had only $3,000 in the bank. So anything over that is, is a good thing. Um, we've rolled the budget for next year, so people are already able to start putting in purchase orders. So at this time of year, it's really for things like summer cleaning supplies, um, you know, possibly if there's uh, any discounts for um, textbooks or anything like that, that's what people would really be buying at this time of year. Um, and emergency repairs, we talked about this in finance committee. Um, but we haven't had any in the past two weeks, which is kind of nice. Um, but we did pay our bills for the uh, the water that drained out of the pool, and that amounted to about fifty thousand dollars. And EverSource was nice enough, and they they took care of the the power failure that affected the uh, AP language test a few weeks ago, which I think much to the uh, absolute dejection of most of the kids at Massac. They saw the buses roll in at about eight fifty five, and then promptly leave the building and I think we all could hear the groans, <laughs> especially from Kevin. Um. <laughs> I was in the lunchroom. <laughs> I could see them. Oh. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so Eversource, it was really, it was, it was good. It was on Eversource's dime, so they were able to take care of that, which was, which was a nice thing. Um, so we're kind of hopeful that for the next um, six weeks, we, we have nothing else break in the buildings. Um, so if everyone could knock on wood, we'd be very, I'd be very grateful. Um, and I think John would too, because then he knows I will not climb off the ledge. Okay, so the Armed School <laughs> Security Officer update. Um, we have hired our second AASSO, um, Mark Caulfield, um, who is a Monroe policeman. And he is retiring at the end of this year. So now both of our armed school security officers are Monroe, retired Monroe police. It, it was pretty clear for the interviews um, that, you know, he knew the, the buildings pretty well, that he, he, know, he knew the players. He really did his research. So we were very happy that, uh, that we have him. So we're meeting with the police chief this week to talk about how to deploy them. Um, Mark is going to start um, on June 4th. And he's only going to be with us until the 22nd or 25th, depending on what happens this afternoon, uh, the tonight. But he's only going to be with us to the, for the remainder of the year. Um, but we think it's good training so that when next year he goes full time, we'll be able to do that. I have to say there was a um, SRO who's on a medical leave, a second one on medical leave at um, Monroe Elementary School. And the chief has put another officer there 
un until we get this all straightened out. So again, the partnership with the Monroe Police Department is fantastic, and they're making sure our buildings are safe, and they've deployed um, another police officer to make sure that happens. And more and more police officers are, and it's, it's, uh, it's something that the whole state is doing, police officers are stopping in and, and talking, going into the office. They're parking their cars in the driveway to do paperwork. So as people drive by the schools, they will see police cars. And that's happening more and more in Monroe and actually across the state. But it's an initiative that the chiefs have put together. So we're really pretty happy about that. <clears throat> the other thing we want to talk about is um, the plan for the power outage. I just wanted to share this with you because I know there was a lot on Facebook about this. So we were here on Wednesday. The administrative team was worked on Wednesday when there was no school. And we were talking about what could we do to not be in a position where we would lose a lot of days. Um, the only school that was without power was Stepney. All the other schools had power. We saw the grounds of all the schools really were pretty well off. A few trees here and there. So we were pretty happy we were pretty lucky on how that happened. But we didn't want to close school because one of our schools didn't have power. And we really weren't sure what was going to happen. We've had, we had mixed messages from Eversource. Um, and what happens is the school system is part of the emergency um, operations command. Operation command and, and we go to the um, police department twice a day to hear updates about road closures and, and um, you know, where Eversource is. So we really weren't hopeful that Stepney was going to be open because they, they still hadn't come out there and started the work. So we talked about what can we do. We could certainly open all the other schools and then Stepney would have to come back an extra day. And that's happened, you know, that happened in Newtown for a school that had a boiler and, and we could have done that. But then we talked about other options and one of the other options we looked into was could we go to St. Jude's? And I have to say that Jack and I um, went to St. Jude's and they were wonderful. They, they opened up their school to us, we got to look around in the classrooms, and that would have been an option of bringing our students to St. Jude's. Now St. Jude's isn't as big as Stepney, so they had a double of classes. We were looking at four or five classes in the cafeteria. It wasn't ideal. And then the more we talked about it, the teachers didn't have any of their materials. Um, what could we do? Well, maybe we could do a, a late arrival day and the teachers could go get the materials, but there was also a third grade um, field trip that day that had to leave at 9 o'clock. So there was a <laughs> lot of kind of crazy things that were happening. And then the other solution, because that one didn't seem to work, was that we could take um, three grades, kindergarten, first and second, and put those students with their um, classmates, same age, same grade, in Monroe Elementary School, and three, four, and five would go to Fawn Hollow. And again, in Monroe fashion, the administrators embraced that idea, sent information to the teachers, and the teachers were wonderful about it. They had ideas. Again, we're talking about hours. That's all we had. This was at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So we sent that out there, and right away we got information from teachers who, were, who embraced the ideas and thought it would be a great idea and it would be fun and we could do it, and, and the kids would actually have some learning going on as opposed to bringing them to St. Jude's and we wouldn't have materials and we would just kept them busy. So that was where we were going to go. We had talked to the nurses, um, Kay Moser that evening talked to the nurses about if we needed to bring um, medication, things like that. So we had the plan. Um, fortunately, at 10 o'clock at night, um, Stephanie got their power back. And that was in part due to um, Ken Kellogg and his pressure, his real pressure on Eversource to get it done. And he was on the phone with us, Jack and I, at you know 9.30, quarter to 10. Uh, we had to call Eversource and say what, we, what was going on and how this was going to be you know, bad for our district. So Ken really did a lot of pressure on that. And so we thank him for that. But the power came back on. So we didn't have to use the plan. But I really wanted to share with you that our teachers and administrators embraced this plan for, to, to work for our students, um, that the students would actually have good learning going on, that that was a, an option. So again, I want to thank the teachers because it, it wasn't going to be easy. It wasn't going to be, oh, just another day. But they embraced it. And um, as a matter of fact, Jack and I have gotten some emails saying, you know, that, that would have been a great idea. Maybe we could plan for that. <laughs> um, we're not really right there yet. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I just wanted to share that with you. So that was our plan. So we did have a plan B if we needed to. Any questions about plan B? Okay. John. I thought it was 
No, go. I didn't raise my hand. You go. <laughs> <laughs> I got a filter. <laughs> yeah. um, thank you. Two quick things. Uh, Chalk Hill is not in the condition to, to no, absorb No, Chalk Hill it. is totally closed. It's, it, can't, it can't be inhabited because it has no support, um, fire suppression. Or anything. Okay, my, my second question was, um, could we enter into an agreement with a generator company where they tow the big ones in and do the pre-work so that they just plug it in and you power it on? Something we can look at, uh, you know, maybe Jack can look at that. That was the 930, that was going to be Eversource's plan. They were going to bring a big generator in. But if that's something that we could do and have it set up for that. It seems like Stephanie's always the school that loses the power. Yeah. So maybe we can look at that, Jack, and, and see what we think about that. Yeah. Oh, well, great. Thank you. Just another idea. Yeah. yeah. That's a good idea because if you're wired for it, then you just need the generator. Then you just come in. Okay, they have big ones on the trailer. Some of, some of my clients have them, and they just they and roll in, the they plug school? in, and they, they power entire facilities, yes. Oh, well, that's great. Yeah, the ones on trailers. Yeah, um, big big watertight connections. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you enter into a contract with somebody, then you are reserved one in, in right. storms like this. So. We can certainly look and see what that's yeah. That's a great idea. Yeah, that is a great idea. I just thought it was a creative solution. Mm -hmm. I thought it was. I don't. I don't get um, my news from Facebook in general. <laughs> I don't you know, look at that as, as a news source. So I don't really pay we'll much to attention to that. But um, but I thought it was a really good creative solution to get. You would have been probably hearing it any way you sliced it. But if you had people who had to go later than other right. schools, I it would not have been pretty. Yeah, yeah. right. I, I think ultimately we were going to have everybody else come in if that didn't work and Stephanie would just have to come a day later. That's probably ultimately what we've done, so I'm so glad we didn't have to do that. Right. Good. Good. And then the last thing I want to just talk about is our hiring status. Um, we're in pretty good shape. You know, we had 14 people who have retired, um, a few uh, resignations, so we've been hiring right along. Uh, as it stands right now, we're just waiting for classroom observation demonstration lessons for the middle school math teacher and um, the uh, Stephanie Elementary teacher who transferred to Fawn Hollow in one of the open positions. Where, um, they're going to interview this week. Uh, Sheila's part of that interview this week. We're waiting for that. Um, and the security guard at Massick, which is open because Captain Flick left to become the armed school security officer. We are waiting on that because right now we have a custodian that's on light duty, so um, he's able to act as a security guard, so we're waiting on that. And then we have a few paras, um, the educational technology teacher, and we're, we do have a couple of positions in the budget that we're just waiting to see where uh, enrollment falls before we do that hiring. So I know it's later in the year than normal, but we wanted to make sure that we have the right um, grade level. It's elementary. So that's where we are with that. So happy with that. Any questions? Bajana, anything? All right, we'll move on. Um, next up is our presentation, and we're having a presentation on the new homework policy that's before everybody. And they're all going to come up, and we're all going <coughs> to move and disperse. <laughs> So as you can see, we have a rather large group presenting tonight, and it's representative of the work that was done with Curriculum Council this year. Just to give you a, a quick overview, and then everybody's going to share in this presentation tonight, we took a new approach with this topic in Curriculum Council this year, and it's always good to try something new. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to delve into a problem, and we wanted to get everybody involved in resolving that as best we could and homework was one of the things that we came up with as a topic. There was interest by parents, staff, administration about wanting to improve the policy and make it better for students and for staff. So we had a great collaborative effort and again this is representative of the people that were involved. We had board representation, we had administration, we had parents, we had teachers and really some outstanding work had occurred. So what this group is going to walk you through is a chronology of the work that occurred this year. It was a very substantive project that was taken on that occurred over a months, uh, months and months. And they're going to walk you through the work that was completed. And I'll give you a quick little helicopter view. These guys will get into a lot more detail in it in a second. Um, just kind of the steps that we took to um, arrive at the draft policy that you see before you tonight. Um, starting with, um, you know, first when we got this group together, looking at a lot of the research that was out there on homework. Um, there was one study in particular, a meta-analysis of, I think, close to 100 different studies over the last, like, 30 or 40 years 
of uh, the value of homework, pros and cons to it. Um, so we looked at a lot of the research that was out there right now. Uh, we did a lot of surveying. Um, we surveyed students, uh, grades 3 to 12, parents in all of those grades, um, teachers in all those grades as well. Um, so we looked at that. And then we looked at a lot of the best practices that are out there. We looked at what's going on in some of the other districts um, around us and around the country, quite honestly. Uh, and we've kind of put that all together. And that's the, the policy that you see before you tonight. We're very fortunate on Curriculum Council to have 42 members who receive the email notification of our monthly meeting. And we have approximately 25 to 30 who attend the meetings on a regular basis. The people who are noted in red are part of our presenters tonight. And as Dr. Zamory said, we are fortunate to have a Board of Ed member, Jeff Falcino, is on our board, uh, our committee, as well as a uh, parent is uh, Pam Srinivasan. Close. Sorry about that. Um, and a parent perspective is really important for us, too, as we're taking a look at these courses and things that are happening. Okay, so our timeline began in August. The teachers had an opportunity to attend EdCamp for their professional development at the start of the school year. EdCamp is a new style of professional development where teachers bring all of their topics of interest and concern and present them on boards. Um, in our case, we presented it to our administrators the day in advance. They created a master schedule for us where teachers were then allowed to choose the next day which topics would be most beneficial to their classroom instructional practice to attend for the workshop. Um, there was an overwhelming amount of interest in the topic of homework from a K-12 standpoint, both teachers at the elementary and secondary levels. So much so that they decided to have three different sessions offered that day at Ed Camp on homework. All three were very well attended by staff at the elementary, middle, and high school level. There was a lot of rich conversation and debate. And that ended up coming back to our curriculum council then in September to decide that that would be our focus topic for this year. One of the first things that we did was we took a look at the article um, that is up on, on the board, the case warrant against homework. It was by Robert Marzano and Deborah Pickering. And it was really a synthesis of really eight of those 100 studies that Mr. Cogza uh, mentioned. And the article really took the stance that taking away homework altogether would be wasting an opportunity for extending learning. Um, it did look at all of the drawbacks to homework that a lot of parents and teachers and students talk about, the time that it takes away from family and sports and other activities, the anxiety that it produces, the inability sometimes or the difficulty to differentiate with homework. Um, some students take much more time and struggle with the homework assignments than other students. Um, and teachers may not be aware of that when that's happening. Um, but really what it came down to was the authors found that statistically there was no argument that homework really does help increase and extend learning and it's an opportunity that can't be missed. So that led us um, looking into choosing different topics that we wanted to focus on and talk about from a K-12 perspective. And so we took those um, topics and we kind of made a pro and con list, some of the benefits of homework and some of the challenges of homework and then we took that and in small groups that were interdisciplinary and mixed grades we looked at ranking those as like what is most important to us, what is somewhat important, what is less important, and then took all the ones that were most important and made them a real focus for um, what would eventually be part of the draft policy. We also wanted to make sure we were including all of the people who weren't just on the committee, including parents and students and staff. And so we took questions and drafted them to be included in the climate survey that students starting grades three take all the way up to grade 12, parents of students and also our staff take and using those results to further our discussions on the homework um, policy and problems and um, challenges with homework. And at the next meeting, we first reviewed the results of that survey. And what we found was correlation in the, among parents, students, and teachers, what the amount of time that teachers believe they are signing for homework was also the amount that parents and students are report, reporting that they're spending on homework. Furthermore, the results, the times that were reported by the um, those who took the survey reflected the ideal times in the research, in the, the article or the, the work that Laura mentioned. There were certain um, time frames that were recommended as the, the most effective, either too little or too much was um, not a good thing, and, and our survey results actually reflected what the research said. Um, 
we also took a look at, and it was something that had come up in earlier meetings, the idea of a homework-free period. And we read an article from a district that had um, incorporated that a few times throughout the year. We, we discussed it, um, and it was going to go back to the subcommittee. We came to consensus on uh, the homework-free period, and then a subcommittee um, formed to actually draft the policy amendment. So like um, she mentioned, we broke out into a subcommittee and we brainstormed and summarized some key points. So some of the key takeaways um, from this was that homework is dif differentiated by different levels. Of course, kids in elementary school, um, in the lower elementary, upper elementary, the middle school and high school would have um, different amounts of home varying homework. Um, obviously, so kids at the elementary would have like, for example, 10 minutes based on that time or the first grade level, um, there's that formula. Um, Another key point was that homework must be purposeful um, to reinforce the learning, maybe have to prepare for tests, things of that nature, so teachers might not do as much as busy work, what kids consider busy work. And um, Another takeaway um, was that reading is essential. Um, we're building a culture of literacy. So when the kids don't have homework, or we are still encouraging reading. Um, and. Um, the fourth key point was that homework varies based upon course selection. So if the kids are selecting um, courses such as um, honors homework or the college prep homework might not have as much homework as the higher level, as AP level homework. So we should need, we need to, in the homework policy, mention that in the course selection, homework times may vary. And when parents or kids are going to select um, their courses for the high school level, they need to take into consideration, okay, I need to plan for my sports or work or what whatnot based on which level I am going to select. Um, another key takeaway, as she mentioned, was that holidays or other times um, without homework will be considered. So Thanksgiving break, we um, said let's give the kids a break to spend time with their families and of course encourage reading at that time. Christmas break was another time and then the February break and then the April break would be a known homework um, week, except with the exception that April break, we re recognize that high school kids in AP classes, such as my daughter, will still have homework to prepare <laughs> for the AP test, the lying test, the <coughs> snowstorm, but, um, things of that nature. And then um, we wanted to say that um, we encourage attending homework help for kids that need to go to homework help after school um, in the middle school. And then um, we talked about academic honesty. Of course, homework should be the child's own, um, not copying, um, that kind of thing. And then we talked about um, natural consequences um, from not doing your homework. Maybe grades going down, your lower GPA, you're not able to participate in sports, that kind of thing. So these were some of the key points that were discussed and are built into the homework policy. So now Kevin and Michael. Actually, Actually we added we a couple added, other okay. slides. We okay. added a couple slides. Right back. I just, <laughs> we've been looking at that. Quick change. Sorry um, about that. We just wanted to share some of those results that we got from the survey. So this is the elementary homework time. Up in the top left are the student responses, and in the bottom right are the family responses. And up in the top right, you'll see the proposed policy that's in the board's packet today. That has a maximum time for homework by grade level. So K and 1 has a maximum of 20 minutes. Second grade is 30. Third grade is 45. And fourth and fifth is 60. So it's a maximum of 60 minutes. If you take a look at the chart in the top left, maximum time for students, that matches those same times. 0 to 15 minutes, 15 to 30, 30 to 45, and 45 to 60 are all in that red box. And if you look at our chart, that purple is that outlier, which is 60 minutes or more, is 5.4% according to the number of students who answered. And if you look on the family chart, that same 60 minutes or more is 4.9. So about 5% for both are saying that some students are working at 60 minutes or more. And it's very put out to parents all the time on the elementary level. If a child is spending an exorbitant amount of time to please stop having the child you know, work on whatever that is, write a note to the teacher, let them know that it was taking them that amount of time, because maybe there's an issue with understanding. So maybe that teacher needs to spend a little more time with trying to show that child exactly what it is that they need to do. But no child should be spending that much time um, on the elementary level. So this survey was done by students in grades three, four, and five, and the expectation is that it won't be more than 60 minutes. So our policy, the proposed policy, actually falls in line with our survey results, that students are not spending that much time or more. 
So then we have a middle school example here. And same format that Sheila had just shared. What we see here is the student reports. And again, you'll notice that the, um, if we look at the max times here, grade six is 90 minutes, max time grade seven and eight is 120 minutes. So then if we look at our charts, the hour and a half to two hours is up through the green. Purple is the more than two hours. In this instance, you see 15% that are beyond the two hours. That's what students reported. It's interesting, the families, that's the parents reported that beyond two hours is 9%. So a little more variance here. The other piece with middle school is this is the first time when students are choosing more demanding courses. So if they choose to take a higher level math, there's going to be more homework with that too. And that's most likely one of the other explanations for why there's a little more variance with going beyond that uh, two hour threshold. And same format here for the uh, for the high school, and I think Pam kind of already hit this on, on the head a little bit. Um, we have a lot of variants here. Um, you know, just the natural processing speed of, of kids, first and foremost. I mean, I, if any of you guys, anyone with kids knows, my, my two kids are very different. One of them, you know, very thoughtful, took, took a long time to do work. Other, uh, my other daughter, just came a lot quicker to her. Um, the other piece, too, is the, what Pam talked about was the, the AP. That, that accounts for some of the differential that you see in here. You're going to have a lot more work um, at the AP uh, in honors levels. Okay, so after that March meeting where the subcommittee talked, um, came up with the most important points, then we had to make some sense of it. And we knew that we had to make sense of this for all the stakeholders. So we wanted to put structure to the homework policy that actually also reflected where we're going as far as goals and beliefs of our district, because we want everything to be aligned in that way. So. As you look at the homework policy in front of you, the draft homework policy, the first thing we do is we make a statement. And we make a statement of belief, what we believe about homework as a district. Um, this was reviewed by the entire committee, and we made changes to this as a committee, and we um, wordsmithed some things and made sure that we were hitting all the important points. Um, should you, do you want us to go through each piece of this, you think? Is it? Maybe highlight yeah. the key pieces? So one thing that we want to talk about is that we did believe it was an important piece, that we wanted to make sure that all stakeholders said we believe that homework is an important thing to happen. Um, we also wanted to support the idea of research. We're definitely a district that wants to make decisions that are based on research. So our second paragraph talks about the research that we use sort of as a basis of our decision making um, in relationship to the uh, surveys and the information we got from other districts. So you see in the second paragraph that we specifically quoted the relationship between the amount of homework and the achievement outcomes. The second part of this is the objectives. We know as we go into classrooms, we like to see teachers have objectives on the board. We know that students make more sense of what's happening if there's an objective. That's true for all of us. And for us to be able to have homework objectives and what homework should do will help guide our professional development, will help guide parents to know what homework's supposed to do. And when they want to communicate with teachers about purpose with homework, that will help us. So we have four objectives there um, for homework. Uh, I was going to touch. One thing we brought in, Lisa mentioned earlier, was the homework-free periods. Um, and, and the statement that starts this paragraph, I think, is a pretty powerful statement. It says, an effort to recognize the importance of family time and to encourage students to explore their own interests and read independently. Um, we know they do a lot of reading in the school year. A lot of it has been assigned to them. This gives them an opportunity to really choose what they want to read. You know, pick something that really might not be something they see in the classroom, but something they're just interested in, or spend more time you know, with family, spend more time doing other things and not have to sit and be burdened down with a lot of homework during these, these holidays or these, these different periods. Um, so we, we offer it up in October, a weekend, so seniors are able to work on their applications for college, work on their essays. Uh, we said Thanksgiving break for November, December during the winter break, the February mid-break, and then during the April break, except for those obviously preparing for the AP exam, to give them an opportunity to not have homework aside so they can pursue other interests. Uh, the teachers are giving uh, guidelines in terms of when they can assign them or not assign them. So the first three days after the breaks, long-term assignments cannot be due um, or assessments cannot be given maybe two days after um, the break. So again, it allows the students to unwind, do other things, do other activities, and not worry about the homework as much. The next section of homework guidelines is 
really takes, and one, one thing that we wanted to do as a committee was streamline this. Our old homework policy had guidelines for elementary, for middle school, and for high school. And when we looked at it, there was a lot of redundancy in it. So we said, what are the main points, what are the salient points that we could really go to um, to help us as a K-12 district? We definitely behave as a K-12 district. We're not as segmented, I think, as we once were. So we wanted to look at it as a K-12 district. And there are responsibilities from each one of the stakeholders. Um, the teacher responsibilities are there. And as I said before, these are going to be very helpful, I think, with professional development and for us to say, how do we support better homework assigning? How do we support instruction that takes place outside of the classroom? Um, so you see those there. There's also the part about student responsibilities. And I know up at the high school, we spent a lot of time talking about academic honesty, and that was a really important piece to put in here that wasn't necessarily in there as clearly before. Um, with student responsibilities, besides talking about their responsibility for recording assignments, making sure they understand the assignments, and finding a good place, we wrote, they are responsible for completing their own work unless given explicit instructions from the teacher. If they are having difficulty with a specific assignment, they should communicate their questions to their teachers. This policy now being written in a world of electronic communication makes it a lot easier for students to communicate with teachers um, outside of, you know, outside of the school hours. I know most students will throw an email to a teacher and will get an email response back pretty quickly about questions. They don't have to sort of flounder for, you know, overnight and wonder what's going to happen when they get in the next day. Um, that, in addition to Google Classroom that so many teachers are using and other websites, um, helps that communication. So it was important that we reflected that change in technology also in this. Um, for parent responsibilities, we want to let parents know we expect you to be a partner in this. Um, if you're seeing your kid become so stressed out, if they can't seem to get this done in a reasonable amount of time, pick up the phone, send an email, let's have a conversation about it. I know when I'm in the classroom, sometimes you don't even know, the kid comes in smiling, oh yeah, that was great, thanks for the homework. You know what I mean? But they were just spending three hours in tears at the kitchen table and you have no idea. And when the parent lets us know that, that helps us you know, differentiate what happens for that student. And we, all teachers want to be able to do that and make them successful. Um, we did ask them to, um, in case of extended absence, the teacher should be contacted to arrange makeup work. And we say that is going to be if it's more than three days. That's how we defined the um, extended time period. So those are those three areas of responsibility that are really streamlined and fit into a page and a half instead of, I think, five pages before, which is helpful for all. And as mentioned before, there are guidelines um, for each of the grade levels. You start with K-1, where it's about 20 minutes, and it increases as you go through the elementary school into the middle school, where by 7th, 8th period, we're looking about an hour and 20, I'm sorry, 120 minutes um, of homework. As you get to the high school, it really depends on the course. Um, some of the more demanding courses, the AP courses, there are going to be more hours of homework involved with that course. Um, we also recognize, too, that we give maximum. There might be times where it might be a little more, it might be a little less. But you know, as the most part, those guidelines give us a maximum of what to expect in terms of homework at that grade level. And I know it's said a couple of times, we'll say it again, if you, you know, parents find their student and their, their son or daughter having to spend a lot of time on homework, please call, let us know, give us that feedback so that we could take a look at the assignment, work with the student, work with the family, and see what's best for, for the child in terms of their homework. Just a couple of final thoughts and then we'll take questions. Uh, first of all, a huge thank you to all these people and the committee. It really was wonderful work. Homework can be a very, very challenging topic to get consensus among all the different stakeholders. We collectively left this excited about the outcome. I think to a person, and chime in if you feel differently, but we got to the end of this and we said, wow, this is really something we're very, very proud of. The second thing is I just wanted to dovetail on what Mike was mentioning about next steps here. This document provides a resource for us to work with teachers on how is homework most purposeful and for teachers to work with students on what are your obligations as a student to have good clarity around that and also for us as administrators to work with parent groups and say, look, this is what we created as something we could all agree to. What are things parents can do to help and promote their child's achievement? Because one of the things that the research shows very clearly is there is a positive correlation between completing homework and performance at school. And at the end of the day, that's what we all want is for our kids to be successful. So really, I want to thank all these people. It was a wonderful, wonderful job and uh, very proud of, to be a part of the work with, with all these, these fine people. Questions? So 
Sure. I'll, I'll start. So, so the policy that's before us tonight, uh, Jerry and I did review uh, at our last policy meeting. Um, uh, we wouldn't have sent this forward if we didn't think that it was something that was uh, <laughs> that captured the goals and objectives of the district. That it that it really encapsulated what we're looking for here to what we're looking to attain, and that it's something that's we wouldn't have sent if it was something that we didn't believe was attainable and enforceable. Uh, that being said, it's not it, it shouldn't just go forward in our opinion without discussion. Okay, so as this group uh, brought this to us, and you see representatives from all different areas of the district, uh, so should we opine here and really give our opinions, uh, because it is a it is a subject, it is a topic that you know hits all of us. A lot of us have kids still in the district, so um, it's open for discussion. It's open for revision as as needed. My, my personal opinion on it uh, is that it reads a lot better than the prior version. It's much more streamlined and straightforward. Uh, and it, um, it, it really does capture uh, that we're looking at this from a standpoint of being purposeful and trying to achieve a goal here for the kids, right? Uh, but there are some things in there around that maybe, you know, some people may find um, you know, the subject of conversation, specifically in my opinion, you know, how much is the right amount for kids at different age groups. And having a daughter in sixth grade, a son in fourth grade, and a daughter in, in first grade, I, I can see the various levels of homework that they get, and I can see the progression through the years of what they're getting, and I've questioned through, through uh, as my kids have gone through school, how much is too much? How, how do we find that balance, right, between family, as the, as the group had suggested, between sports and other extracurriculars, extracurricular activities, uh, and learning, and continuing your learning as you come home? Um, how much? How much is? How much is enough? How much is adequate? How much is too much? So, uh, I want us to. to to talk about those kind of things tonight, Jerry, you were, you were in that discussion as well. Yeah, I, you know, I've I've read it and I've thought a lot about it, so I can only really go back to when I was in the classroom. So, Mike, I have a question for for you. Sure. You know, all, all my years that I spent, I would constantly hear the academics question what happened when a child was away mm -hmm. for a week yep. during the school year. I, I brought this up at the meeting. What? How does this address? The child who went on a conference, and, I thought, you know, and, and I'm not questioning why, right. but they went with mom and dad away from school while we mm -hmm. were in session. Now they come back, and it seems like sometimes it's perceived as the teacher's responsibility. Yep. Am I making any, any no, sense? No, you are. Go ahead. I think we talked about like the extended absence over the three days, if you know. Um, I think the schools also have policies, specific policies. Um, that are not district, I mean, mm -hmm. jump in about like, because we have specific yeah, policies. Yeah, normally right? if a, if a you know, kid's gonna be out more than three days, we'll ask them to contact their teachers, and the bare minimum we try to ask our teachers to do is to get, provide them with the work while they're away. To, to, the best thing is so they can, the best way I say to the parents is so they can hit the ground running when they come back, because right. it's tough. But on. that expectation <laughs> cannot, cannot always be <clears throat> met as much either, because sometimes you don't know what's gonna happen on a Thursday or a Friday. Of if they call you the Friday before, and I think that's the communication that needs to happen to parents is there is an expectation that when there is school, you're gonna, you do have to catch up on work. And we will do the best to give them what they need in advance, but when you get back, there may be some work that's gonna need to be done. I think um, technology has changed. Uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, using the headline and the calendar on the homework, teachers put in the homework every night on the yeah. calendar. So even students who are away mm -hmm. can look on the calendar and, and see what the work is. And I know that that's, that's been a game changer. Google Classroom, too. I mean, kids can, kids can you know, teach us yeah. shaking their head because they can, they can follow along a lot easier with Google Classroom. Because the other big thing, you know, and I think Mike was just hitting on it, was, you know, if you go away, whatever, for whatever reason it is, you are missing X amount of days of instruction in the classroom and you might have to come back and put a little extra time in, you know, extra help or whatnot. Right. Um, I've always found our teachers to be fantastic with that in terms of meeting kids during free periods, lunch periods, after school, before school. 
Yeah. Besides the better language and being more concise, how is it different than the current policy? With the homework free periods, homework free putting free the homework free periods in policies. Actually, the homework free weekends, the holidays, those kind of things, to not have homework on those Christmas breaks. Mm -hmm. Am I right? Yep, yeah, that's a huge piece. The idea that we post homework online, that teachers, <coughs> as far as teacher responsibility, the posting homework online is a new thing. The elements of academic honesty and doing <coughs> your work is a new thing for it. Um, and also putting in the idea of independent reading and critical reading and the importance of that. Um, so it all sort of goes, I mean, there's a, that level of, homework is academic, but it's also social in some way. There's this sort of social aspect to homework and responsibility and um, what that does for students, given that responsibility. So we highlighted some of those pieces that we noticed. We also put in like the maximum, I think, in middle Absolutely. school, which yeah. wasn't there before. Oh, so yeah. that's a good yeah. guideline for the teachers, plus or minus 10. It's a good guideline. Yeah, I think there was no maximum. Right. There, there was maximum. But we rem the minimum has been removed. Minimum. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. What other districts did you talk to or consult with? Well, I think it was Westport was one of the ones that we looked at with the homework free Correct. time yeah. period. We looked at I I pulled a bunch from actually across the country mm -hmm. as far as what the policies, how they read, mm -hmm. what they looked like, how they were handle handling technology, how they were handling academic honesty. We looked um, at uh, the Cape core policy too, yeah. mm -hmm. which sort of serves as the backbone for a lot of that. <coughs> I looked at so. things in Europe, I looked at modern studies and how they're, they're doing their homework in what country is going to be here or yeah. Norway or some of these countries that are top five in education in the world has. Yeah, Finland. But right. we <laughs> talked about how the curriculum or things are different here, so we you know, kind of debated right. those kind of things and talked about what is it they're doing there. But, So, so this is a policy, right? It doesn't cover everything. When we get into, to separate from the policy, you look at what an SOP would be, right? So in practice, um, the, I look at, you know, the, the, the amount of time that, that we're estimating would be a maximum. So uh, how are those times arrived at? Are they, depending on student levels, are we gearing that towards the middle of the road student, how are those times arrived at? It's a good question, George. It really was triangulated in that it was the research and the meta study, which we can email a copy out to you. In the meta study, our, our times align almost to the minute, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. So that was one piece of information. Our old policy, too, the maximums don't vary a lot, from what I recall. And then the third part was the surveys. Uh, when we looked at the surveys to see what's actually going on, those three things together uh, pinpointed those um, outcomes that you see in, in, in the, the draft policy. Yeah, now so it's a balance to, of all those factors to get to that that. It's a balance of all those, and to your question, too, about, um, you know, what about the variance among children? I mean, as, as Joe said so, uh, so clearly, I mean, my two daughters, too, they're very different kids. Um, you know, one, she would work, to, she would just, you know, work all night. She was an AP kid, you know, she chose to take some really heavy duty courses. With that came some really long homework se sessions. Um, our other daughter was a good student, but she chose not to take some of those. Her homework was not as much. Um, they were also different in their processing. And you, you, you see it, if we've got more than one child at home, you see it. The variance and how they go about that work. The policy is the best effort to try and look at the norms across all children. There's always going to be variance amongst children. And if something isn't working for a specific child, then it's got to be a conversation with the school because this policy is a guidepost. It is not perfection for every child. Sure. So then it's got to be the conversation with us to figure out what is the best path for the individual student. Okay. And again, in terms of practice day to day, as the teachers, so as you get into middle school, if diff different teachers for different subjects. How How is homework coordinated between those teachers to ensure that there's not one teacher assigning the maximum? And Caitlin, I, I can speak to that. My name is Caitlin Noble. I teach eighth grade at Jockey Hollow. And right now, the way we're set up is we're on teams. So we're all on the same team. So we all the teams meet every other day and while it's maybe not a perfect situation and it can always have room for improvement the teachers are talking to each other about the same group about 120 kids on our team so we know when the assessments are being given who's got a project coming up who's got a test coming up who's assigning a big 
a reading assignment. So there is communication between the teachers on the same team. Okay. In here too in the data one thing we didn't share only because it's hard to interpret is we did look at the teacher data middle school high school in terms of what are the norms per class the reason why we didn't share that is those norms per class it's hard to figure out okay uh, I've got these three classes what's it total up to but when we looked at the norms by uh, types of class the consistency there is consistency among the types of classes in terms of the length of time that teachers are assigning homework check I like the idea of no minimums because um, you're talking about homework should be purposeful and meaningful and I think if you put a minimum there you know that would just kind of encourages busy work and mm -hmm. I, I like mm -hmm. that you guys and that's did that. part of what we discussed uh, within the policy committee is we want to get away from that if it's going to be purposeful it should be timely and relevant and if we're just saying it's got to be done every night it doesn't really get right. to those ends Jack, let's mm -hmm. do a question more of a comment sure Please. the Especially at the lower levels, I think. We're, the upper levels, we have more choice, right? They could choose harder, more mm -hmm. difficult courses. But at the lower level, elementary, to be able to differentiate, you know, and push the kids that need to be pushed, mm -hmm. I know it's, make it more, a less of a one-size-fits-all mm -hmm. for homework. Mm -hmm. you know? And, you know, I'm sure you, the teacher, it's not going to be easy, mm -hmm. but to stress to make it more individual based push mm -hmm. the kids that need to be pushed you know help the kids you know that need more help mm -hmm. um, you know so if I could add one comment that would be it that that's a spot yeah that we should continue and it, it's uh, somebody had mentioned it tonight it is a challenge and something we need to continue to work on I think in the reading side we do it better uh, you know in terms of the text that students are bringing home are they're leveled based on their specific need a place that it is more challenging and where we need to continue to figure out better ways is things like math and then uh, you know those kinds of areas it is more of a challenge and something we need to continue to do this kind of work and figure out what are the best solutions within that kind of content um, Jack I think um, overall and thank you all I think the document is very um, it, it it's understandable it's it's you know complete um, I, I, I like it I like the expectations of it because now whether you're a teacher, a parent, or a student, you can read this and say, okay, I can expect an hour or whatever it is every night or up to an hour every night. So I can plan my evenings. I can plan my sports. I can plan, you know, my get outside time. Um, so I think that's, that's very good, you know, as far as the expectations and being able to plan your, your evenings or your weekends. So I think that's a good thing. And I also think that students may and parents may stress a little less if they say, okay, well, I can only get an hour or about that much. Um, you know, I'm not going to be here for three hours every single night um, and I have to cancel basketball or whatever mm -hmm. because I'm going to have X amount of homework. So I, I like the expectations and, and everything being laid out ahead of time for everybody. Like we're really hoping that those homework-free periods, too, will be another de-stressor for families. Yeah. You get to Thanksgiving. Something to look forward to. All right. Sure. You know, just focus on family. Don't worry about the other stuff. Yeah, no, we appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Just a comment for me again, another example. We have teachers here who spend time starting at 4 o'clock to sit on this committee, um, and it's a large committee, and then when they're here tonight to present, it's just another example of how commitment, uh, committed we all are. We have a parent here. Pam has been with us the whole time and, and really has great input, so I, I just can't say enough about the work that this group has done. I think it's moved the curriculum council to a different direction. Before it was, we're just going to hear about mostly massive courses and approve them and move on. And now they're, they're taking a big topic. These are really hard topics to, to tackle, and they're tackling it with research and then coming back and talking about it and having arguments about it. It's, it's kind of neat to watch the whole progression. So thank you for that and for bringing this to another level. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thanks. <coughs> Thank you. So, George, Donna, is this our first review then? That's our first yeah, review. Yeah, so we vote on this next one? Yes. Next meeting? Yes, this would be our first review on this. So, this will come up on the next agenda for a vote. Yeah. Um,
Um, all right, we have no old business e this evening, so we will move on to new business, and we have two policies, uh, another two policies up for first review. Uh, the first one is 5142, student safety, and obviously 51, I'm sorry, 6154, which is the homework one. George, did you want to talk anything about the student safety one? So the school safety one was a complete rewrite of it. Uh, we took the, uh, and this is for state guidelines? Correct. Okay. And uh, we took the K <coughs> version, the K recommended, recommended version, and we just made some edits to it. You'll see in red line uh, that were, that fit our district better. Perfect. Anybody have any questions on that? All right. So they will be up for review the next time. Um, Next item on the agenda is the 2017-18 <coughs> calendar with the vote anticipated. Um, so we will start with okay. <laughs> John, go for it. All right, here we go. Um, <laughs> a, a couple of things that I want to share with you. One is that we did get a, um, a letter from um, our CAPS organization, which is um, the superintendent's organization, f that after they talked to the commissioner of education. And basically, it says, not basically, this is what it says. The state board will not offer waivers to districts or schools who have not, who have the possibility of making 180 days prior to July 1st. <coughs> um, if districts request a waiver prior to Memorial Day, the board will require to be open Memorial Day. So E days will not count. So I had a letter ready um, that we got as superintendents to send to the state saying, will you you know look at our 180 days could, could we go less and basically since our 180 days brings us to Tuesday we still have Wednesday Thursday and Friday in June so there was no need for me to submit the letter because they weren't going to approve that so that's just I just wanted to let you know that there's nothing we can do about asking them to make us allow us to have 179 days or whatever but that's okay for us because we go 182 days what I gave you in front of you is the original calendar. So this calendar in front of you is when we started the school year, the last day of school was going to be June 13th. If you look at the back, I listed the days of the closures. We've had nine school closings throughout this year. I know it's hard to do that. Um, so nine school closings. Um, <laughs> that brings us to June 26th if we add those nine days up there. So that's Tuesday of the following week. However, at one of the former board meetings, you decided that the district can go 181 days. Mm -hmm. So given the extra day from last week, that would leave us to Monday, June 25th at 181 days. So now you have some options. Option number one is that you can say, we are all going to go 181 days, and students and teachers and the district is open for Monday, June 25th. Option number two is that you can say, we're going to stick with the state requirement of 180 days, and the last day of school for students will be June 22nd, Friday. And teachers would have two days of PD to make up instead of the one day. Um, that we had from the last vote. So as I see it, that's probably mm -hmm. your only two options. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> if we go through Friday, June 22nd, there's another part of the state requirements that we meet X amount of hours. And we had some um, four hour delays and so forth, four hour early dismissals. If we, keep, if we go to the state requirement of 180 days and get out June 22nd, do we still meet the requirement for the number of hours? We do, we do, I figured that out, we do. 940 hours a year. Um, if you divide that by 180 days, it's five hours and 30 minutes, and we go six hours and 35 minutes. So we're good. So we're good. Yes. 20 seconds seems to make more sense. <laughs> <laughs> Could I, I make know, a just, motion to do that? Or yes, we, not we need a motion to. Can I make a motion to have 180 school days? Yep, and mm -hmm. our last day of school being June 27th. Okay, right. Do I have a second? second. Thank you. 
discussion on it? <laughs> Give it a second, a third, a fourth. The last <laughs> day for students would be June 22nd. The last yes. day for teachers would be June 26th. No, what we'll do is what we did a few years ago. Teachers will have to come up with a PD plan for the I, summer. I remember, um, yeah. And, and now it'll be two days of PD plan. Mm -hmm. Okay. Alan, did you want us to make your comment? No. Um, no, the, I mean, it seems like a no-brainer. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. just one of those years. Oh, it is. Lucky yeah. John. Yeah. Lucky John. It was just one of those well, fluky years. Um, I would imagine graduation stays on the 21st. Mm -hmm. Graduation yeah. is not affected by anything that happens because <laughs> we <laughs> chose yeah, our graduation dates after April 1st. Um, so the state says graduation doesn't change. And that was a lot of, there was a lot of comments on Facebook. A couple of people posted that, oh, the last day of a school can't change because you know, it was after April 1st. That's not true. School will go in the 180 or the 182 days. It doesn't matter when that ends. If that ends, you know, there are school districts like Brookfield. Their last day of school is June 29th right now, and they're going to school on Memorial Day. Wow. I mean, and we would anticipate, we would expect students to come to school on the 22nd, seniors and everyone. Right. So, um, so that is not true. Days keep getting added on. And other people were saying, oh, you can't add days on after May 1st. Again, not true. You keep adding on. You must meet at least the minimum of 180, whatever that lands. And um, it, yeah, it's just a very bad year for a it lot is. of districts. I, I heard new tents June 26th now, I think. And they're still, they're today still, they had no school, had no school still today. from yeah. the store. Yeah. I mean, I feel bad for people who are going to school on Memorial Day, but school will be in session for some of those towns on right. that day um, to meet the requirement. And even doing that, some towns are only at 179, going to the last possible day and going to school right. on Memorial Day. Wow, that's something. Um, so. And, and, and here's another example of why we talked earlier about when Stephanie had no power about Plan B, because we wouldn't be able to even have this conversation because we'd have to make up that day. Right. So Correct. that that splitting up the school and and getting that school day <laughs> in was vital so that we can do what our intent is Correct. here today. Because to get if in. that school was off and everybody else was in session, we'd be at Monday with with going to 180. Correct. Right. Correct. Right. So you know, and I know I know too. Um, a lot of people were complaining about you know why are they doing this and why did they decide that. Here's why. Here's why, because I think the, the administration made the right choice in saying let's do our best to get that day in, even if it had to be split by schools. Mm -hmm. This is this is why. Right. So thank you. All right. Any further discussion? All in favor of going 180 and keeping June 22nd as our last day of school? All right. Motion passes. We are at 180 with June 22nd as the last day of school. All right. Does anybody have anything else? Make a motion to have no more storms, no more snow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no more cold. Unfortunately, we're going to have no option if there is. I know. You see the list back here of all the. Delays? I noticed, John. No. You were busy. Oh, you were busy busy. recording those messages going home this year, weren't you? <laughs> Does anybody have anything no. else? No. Right. To Wait, I just want to oh, say one thing. Last um, Monday, a, a number of us were here with the administrators. Um, working on the Board of Education um, goals and, and uh, objectives for the next three years. It was a fantastic session working together in small groups with everybody. It was, uh, we got a lot accomplished that night. Um, so that will be coming forth and the administrators and teachers will be working on the action plans during the summer that we all decided on and came up with. So. Just thank you to all the administrators and all your hard work. It was truly a great collaborative effort by everybody working here on last Monday. Yeah, it was excellent. Yeah. It was excellent. We got a lot done. And yes. I think the input from the board was just fantastic. Mm -hmm. So yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Great if all school districts could, could function so well together like Monroe <laughs> does. It's so productive yeah. and just went uh, really yeah, well. I agree. You have the buy-in. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's all our own goals. and you know, objectives and missions. So, you know, we should all have a hand in creating them because we're all working together to that common, you know, that common goal. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Now you can do it. Motion to adjourn. <laughs> Second. <laughs> Thanks, David. Oh, oh, just one, one more thing. We, the next board meeting, 6 o'clock, uh, will be the Friends of Education, the Parents Council of Friends of Education here. 
but more, but equally as important, is the seven o'clock retiree uh, reception. It's right. going to be right. here. Please, if you can come to wish our retirees well, that would be okay. great. Seven o'clock. Okay. okay, thank you. Great. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Aye. 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 Aye.